This week in the conversation, I have the privilege to welcome Arthur Katz Otava out of Phoenix, Arizona. We're going to be talking about her fantastic supernatural fiction novel titled Nightmares in Stars. But before we get into this video, I just want to take a few seconds to remind you once more, friends and viewers, it's important to continue to support the channel. And the best way to do this is to subscribe to us. And if you have already subscribed, then you can always tell your friends and family to subscribe to this wonderful weekly literary show. Where we, it's all about books and books and books. So yeah, and if you subscribe and you, you can always uh, click the notification bell so that way every time a video is posted, it'll go directly into your portal. So let's get started. And my name is Ardani Small, and I'm here this evening with an impeccable author. I'm here with Kat Satava. She's reading a wonderful supernatural fiction novel titled Nightmares and Stars. Well, thank and you. Kate, welcome to the conversation. Thank you. Thank you. And I really appreciate you having me here. Um, okay. Do you. So to begin, as we always do in the show, okay. Kat, could you please tell the viewers of CSMS Magazine who is Kat Satava? Well, Kat Satava is a latecomer to the writing game. Um, <laughs> yeah, you know, we all, us authors, we get that little bottom drawer going full of little half-baked manuscripts and, you know, your musings. And um, I had moved here to Arizona and decided about 13 years ago and decided, you know what, I really needed to find a way to have this creative outlet too. You know, like uh, I do have a day job, you know, <laughs> like most authors do. And I really wanted to be able to incorporate writing and how wonderfully therapeutic I feel it can be to write creative fiction and to kind of give yourself a little magic of the world and recognize that magic that we all have in that storytelling. And <laughs> so when I came up with the idea for Nightmares and Stars, I really decided that that was time that I needed to let that author part of me come out. I'm also a single mom um, I have of boys. Uh, two of my boys are already grown and out of the house. And my youngest really? is, yeah. <laughs> I'm about to be, I've become a grandmother. My youngest granddaughter is about to be one in, wow. in March. Yeah. Um, my oldest granddaughter is probably about 15 or, or so years old. Um, we, I have all granddaughters and just, and sons. So, um, it's a big part of my life and my family's a big part of my life. And I really wanted to show them that, you know, uh -huh. the things that you're passionate about are exactly. worth pursuing. And, exactly. you know, I feel passionate about writing and I, I love being an author. And so I'm pursuing it full force. So full swing, huh? Yeah. Uh, by yeah. the way, and, 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 and uh, in terms of fulfillment, mm -hmm. I understand this is uh, an epic series and mm -hmm. which falls under the Witch War series. Correct. And Nightmares and Stars is book one. Correct. Series. Correct. Um, so I, a few years back, um, I was watching, I was really into watching um, news reporters coming back from the Middle East and reporting mm -hmm. on the things that they saw there. And I was watching this YouTube kind of documentary um, uh -huh where they were talking about the perception of war being kind of depends on which side of it you kind of find your place in. And I had this whole flash of this queen going, you know, there's no good side or bad side. There's just her side and my side. Mm -hmm. And that's where this idea came Maybe. from to show, mm -hmm. you know, from a fantasy perspective where we have magic and we have all these, you know, different 
races of creatures and and fantastical beings to show how you know it it kind of means which side do you start on in that and how do you feel about what's happening as a result of those wars and those things happening around you and hold on to your own traditions when there might be bigger stuff coming along that says that they're different and so I really found my home in this series and I, I'm really hoping that um, when people get to read it, they find some way to connect with it. You know, um, I had a lot of beta readers that were non-fantasy readers so that yeah. I could make sure that they also found something that they could enjoy and connect with in the story because I know that fantasy is kind of one of these these new horizons that people are really exploring and and what does that mean and f the fantasy element from different cultural backgrounds i think is really important to bring to the table so i'm really excited that people who don't typically read fantasy were able to find things that they liked about this series and look forward to reading the rest of the books that as they come out, as they come out, you know, as that story comes out, you always have to have a first one, right? right. So I'm hoping really that this really speaks to people and they get an idea of the types of stories that I like to write and the things that I like to come through with in my in my writing. Okay, Kat. So, which means, so let's give them a little sneak preview. Okay. So that, you know, we can just tease them into the story. Okay. <laughs> you know, to swap them there. Alrighty. Saying, this is a story of uh, the war between two nations, I would say. The, right. So then, the, yeah, the, basi ahead. the basics for it is this is this is a world where there's two main factions right now mm -hmm. of that are ruled by witches mm -hmm. and witches in my terminology is kind of like that wizardy effect. They're able to manipulate. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. magic and energy and one side is is ruled by witches who draw that energy from the night and the moon and stars right and they're the the particular side that we start with in in the series is that where the protagonist Alora is from yes Alora is princess of nocturne which is right. the night ruling night witches mm -hmm. lands um they are kind of losing the war at this point. Um, it's been going on for about a decade or so. Um, and Laura is getting ready to come up, be ready for her inheritance of that power from, um, but she's got a few things that are kind of holding her back. She hasn't quite hit a few of those touchstones that she's supposed to have hit. And so, in order to be able to manage that much power so she's kind of in this spot where if i pretend that i don't want it then it won't mean as much to me if i don't get it you know and so we start with her you know in the woods trying to kind of prove herself so give me one second and i will be able to pull that up and we can i can read you a little segment of it beautiful and also and make sure that you give us a little bit also but the back for backstory. Was oh, absolutely, was absolutely. So, in general, they, like I said, they are fighting against um, a another faction. Well, I'm, of, I'm talking about oh. General Biss uh, Tinchill. Oh yes, Jennifer, General Biss Tinchill. Biss is um, from the breed of Tinkers that are kind of this supporting race for the witches they are their advisors they're their scientists if you will they're tacticians and but they're not considered there's a definite caste system within um the witch war you know uh -huh. so they're not quite up on that same level witches tend to marry witches and and engage in relations with witches because that's the most likely chance that you're going to have a witch offspring right so um he and alora alora is young, a little bit younger than him but when he was when she was born the queen tasked him with being her protector okay. and so 
although they're very close in age, he's been spent his whole life training to be her protector and to keep her from harm. And Alora has been kind of one of those uh dives right into harm's way you know she wants to prove herself she doesn't need anybody to keep you know bad guys away she's got this you know and so she's she battles with being friends with him even though he's supposed to save her life which half the time she's kind of like i don't know but i might be a better fighter than you are you know so they have the very you know a lot of obstacles between their feelings for each other because they've been together for so long too it's kind of almost that's that friend bond seeing maybe if it can go somewhere else but in her eyes she's like we can't do anything it's you know against the law anyway so mm -hmm. she's kind of shoving those feelings aside as well so we have this who's very much like worried about her but loves her for her feistiness and then you have Alora who's just trying to figure out how she feels about anything you know anymore she's she's getting to that place where it's time to start being mature about your choices and not always letting your okay, heart now, run everything just give us a little sneak preview sneak sneak preview okay let me get down to that hold on one second i'm so sorry it's okay we are going to go to the, I, I actually feel like I'm going to introduce the second chapter, if that's okay, that's um, where it is with, with Bist's point of view, and mm -hmm. he is waiting for Alora to return. Okay. Chapter two, okay. Bist. Bist's temples throbbed with every heartbeat that passed when she was not in view. The general rubbed the Starfire Medal of Valor point, pinned to his uniform jacket between his thumb and forefinger, mm -hmm. a habit that he developed on the front lines. It kept him from pinching the bridge of his nose, a more obvious sign of worry, a sign you never wanted to telegraph to soldiers beside you, or like tonight, to the guards patrolling the castle walls waiting for their princess to return as ordered by Queen Isadora. He focused on the ridges of the tooled silver and the smoothness of the fire opal in the center. Mm -hmm. Seeing it with the pads of his fingers, his eyes looked over the parapet wall into the city below, while he left his left hand res rested on the small of his back. Mm -hmm. Light twitches of his fingers were the only sign of how hard he wanted to clench his fists. Mm -hmm. Where was she? He could feel the silver ring of his of tinker blood encircling his blue irises until he was sure his eyes must look like mirrors as he glared at the brightening horizon. It was not yet the gray lavender of the dying night. He had watched in terror for the sun to bring with it its an army of horrors too many times to not sense the ascension like the rising of the tide. The worst part was that he knew better. He recognized a lie and in her promise to wait while he gathered a team to go with her. Okay. Even though she lied to him, he couldn't be mad at her though. He knew her like he knew himself and he knew that he would have lied too. She had wisely not given him all of the information on her potential raid, just questions about how he, the general, would solve the rumored gold, gold smuggling. Mm -hmm. If he had known which rumor she had followed, then he would have sent out the special night guard the elite guards that he trained in secret specifically to guard the willful and fearless future queen. The metal was not enough to help push back his irritation and worry, so he ground his palm into the rough edge of the moonstone parapet instead. Okay. I feel like that really kind of encompasses him and Alora's feelings for each other. Like, they love each other's kind of spontaneity and protection of each other but let me ask you something now <laughs> the, the main reason why she is not really interested in telling of oh, oh, the general the complete you know uh, 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 I would say battle plan before right. the state is that is it fair to say it's some sort of a 
not, I'm not going to say power struggle, but power competition. No, I think it's because he doesn't, she doesn't want him to stop her. And he, oh. she knows that if he knows where she's going, mm-hmm. he's going to stop her because it's her putting herself in danger, in danger. you know? Yeah, exactly. And so she's not wanting to give him, you know, like the map to where she's at. So uh-huh. he, um, because she wants to prove herself on her own, that she doesn't need his protection, you know, and really she does. And she doesn't, she doesn't realize that running a, a country in a land is as much about teamwork and working with the people that are there to support you mm. as it is being able to, bur- you know, bear the burdens of those choices mm. by herself. You know, she doesn't, you never run anything alone and she doesn't quite realize that yet you know and i think that um this adventure that the two of them end up going on is what's going to show her like you can't do it alone you can't rule effectively alone you have to have others helping you and supporting you is that is that the kind of lesson that you're trying to uh actually the teachers in the, in the story yes yeah a lot of that is you know because that's Laura's biggest weakness you know she she feels that proving that she's strong enough to do it all alone is what the lesson needs to be mm-hmm. and so she hasn't quite figured out that part yet you know and when you're new to becoming an adult and new to making your choices in the world and you hear from a lot of people what you're supposed to think and you know and i think that i want her to figure out what she's going to think regardless of what she's supposed to think one writer told me once uh you know one of the things that have fascinated her when it comes to fantasy stories is such a beautiful escapism that he has given you given you Right. So do you feel sometimes writing oh, a fantasy story that definitely you have a- really? definitely because there's a, an amount of world building no matter what kind of fiction you're writing right. I feel like you know even if it's like historical fiction that's at places and things that have actually taken place you know you weren't there to take place and part of them so there's an amount of that world building that you're going to experience as an author of those types of genres but with fantasy, it's so immersive. A lot of us get kind of stuck in the world building part of it, you know. Um, I think that that's part of what happened with Tolkien, you know, when he discovered his Middle Earth and his world, you know, he just kind of escaped into it. And it's a very easy temptress to do that with, you know, with fantasy worlds. And because you can make it create it however you see it you know mm-hmm. it can- growing up you know writing fantasies was there a particular fantasy author who inspired you oh i see when i was growing up i would say when i got to this phase and i really discovered fantasy and really decided i really liked it um it would have to be kind of Anne rice was an introduction to that in her interview with a vampire and I actually had done a book, an author report on her and the things that she worked through while writing Interview with a Vampire just really inspired me to want to create like that and to be able to ins- to touch other people with my stories without having to give them all of my story. Mm-hmm. Does that make sense? Oh, you know, it does. Yeah, so uh, I know this is book one, Mm -hmm. right? Yes. So is it fair to say that book two is on its way also? Yes. Um, So part of how I have structured this series is Ah. that book one and two are taking place at the same time Mm -hmm. from different sides of this war. Mm -hmm. So in book one, we get all of the nocturne side of Mm -hmm. how, what things are going on Uh and in this adventure and in this journey. So book two is going to be from the point of view of the Soldanians that they're fighting against. Really? Okay. That's yeah. Yeah. So we're going to get to weigh out the options before we get to book three. So, um, (laughs) Nice. to see which side we uh we want to root for you know and so 
I, in going with that theme of of seeing who's the good guys and the bad guys, you know, is based on what you know about them, right? You know, and so. But would you still keep the protagonist, Alora, and both? No, no, Alora's yeah. gonna be um, actually the protagonist of the second book, which is temporarily named Mirages and Sunfires, okay. is um, is Raelia. She's the queen of Soldania and her brother um liam her twin brother liam who is also a ruler there and they are just coming into their own uh -huh. as well so um there's there's a lot of are we ready right uh -huh. are we ready for this new world that we're saying we want or do we want this world to look the we switch to something cozy because we okay. know we human. Okay? Yes, yes, now yes. You, you're a mom. I am. Also, and I'm pretty sure that you cook. And then now he's I doing do. that. I think the, the cuisine might be <laughs> with his approach, right? It can be, yeah. We have a lot of transplants from all over the country that come here. Like, so you have like across the street from maybe something that's more Tex-Mexy, you might have um, really good pho restaurant or, you know, uh, an ice cream shop, you know, it, it's very diverse here. Yeah. So, so uh, what, which one is your favorite cuisine? In Arizona? Ooh, in Arizona, I would say my favorite cuisine is actually kind of um like street food just like at fairs and stuff like that i like the i like the, we have a lot of food trucks out here because we have pretty decent weather most of the year yeah. um the biggest thing you're having to look out for is you know it getting too hot and um so i really like street mexican food it's mm -hmm. probably my favorite because it reminds me of home on top of that, you know, going Southern California, Riverside, you know, California, yeah, right? Riverside, California, yeah. there's not too many corners that don't have taco shacks on them. So, <laughs> you know, it's nice every once in a while to get a taste from, from home, you know, and not have to drive six hours to get there to get it, you know? So I, I love, I love our, our uh, Mexican American cuisine here. That's kind of just diversifying all over the place so always work together with music yes so cat so what is your favorite music it depends on my mood of the day so really? yeah <laughs> yeah actually i have a pretty diverse um, listening factor some days you know like i want the coziness of holiday music and then other days i'm you know i really love 90s gangster rap which i know is kind of <laughs> Odd, like but that, huh? yeah, yeah um, you know again i'm a socal girl so we you know i grew up with that music and so i really love it um i also like country music and classical okay. music you know so it kind of depends on what the mood i'm pursuing is for the day oftentimes it's kind of just a mix of of stuff you know and who is your book. favorite author of all time it oh my favorite author of all time yeah I would have to say right now it would be Liba Bray. Um, Who? Who that person? Is? Liba Bray. Her name is spelled L-I-B-B-A. Mm -hmm. Okay. First name. Uh, last name is Bray. B-R-A-Y. She mm -hmm. writes young adult fiction mm -hmm. um, with a supernatural twist, of course. <laughs> <Yeah>. uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, she manages to get into the voices of people like in a way you would never believe it's the, okay. her her stuff is just beautiful i highly recommend if you read nothing else um by her read the opening chapter of going bovine okay. which is one of my absolute that would be quite intriguing going yeah. bovine huh? it's it's actually about a kid who gets mad cow disease so um it's okay. very it's and it starts off where he tells you about the trip to Disneyland he took when he was five and he almost died. It's it's very amusing and she has just a great, great sense of adventure in her writing. I really, really love her stuff. Great. So uh, my last question, Kat. Mm -hmm. If there's a lesson you want to give to a friend who would want to embark upon a journey 
writing supernatural fiction. Mm. So what lesson would you give that friend? Oh, be careful what you wish for. (laughs) (laughs) Just because it can become so enticing by that world and to stay in that comfort zone and stay in that world that you've created. So um, the best advice that I would give them is to read broadly, you know, honor the people that you enjoy reading by, you know, seeing how to incorporate what they do into what you do, you know, and get your message out there. Like that, that's probably the most important thing I think in fantasy is to start kind of with a message of what, what the journey means to you and that will that will shine through your journey that in your story it's not so much that we're rootless but we're kind (laughs) of like we're kind of like a traveling circus right that has definite routine stops and places but Uh every once in a while you got that one-off city that you know you got to to touch by and see what you're going to learn there we're we're kind of adventurers at heart so we're you know the whole saying not all who wander are lost i think that's kind of that's the novelist's credo like you know we're always wandering okay so with that i'm just going to say it's been such a pleasure same same. such a beautiful chat with my friend kat savannah thank you Thank you so much for having me. You, you've been so pleasant and welcoming, and I really appreciate this opportunity to talk with you and your, your guests and the people that listen to your podcast. Anytime, anytime, Doctor. Okay, thank you so much.